Uh, if anyone comes in, point them that way to those couple chairs over there. So, um, so there was a, um, this is, we're going to do, a, we do evaluation forms after each session. So um, I'm going to ask, Britt, would you pass these out real quick? Just for, so these are for Brent's, um, when you're done, you can just put them up here at the front. Um, oh, you have one in your, okay, got it. You've got it, so great. Okay. Well, I'm well, out of a job. Yeah. Well, welcome, everyone. It's so good to have you here. I'm Danielle Barda, and before Brent leaves, um, he probably didn't get to introduce himself very well, but if you don't already know Brent Millward, he is just a legend in public administration in our field. He's the first person that ever, uh, first group of people who ever started to say networks and study them, so you probably didn't even know the the, the history of who was standing in front of you, but we're just always so excited that Brent's here. So thanks, Brent, for. So I'm ancient. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I, I was when I went to school, he was the one I was learning from. So good to have you here. Okay, um, I'm Danielle Vara. I am from the University of Colorado Denver here in the School of Public Affairs, and I am the director of our Center on Network Science. Um, so. Uh, I wanted to assure you that we are doing icebreakers and introductions, so that's all part of the big session where we're going to have even more people than are here right now, so we'll have a way to do that and kind of, I even do an interview where I get to kind of introduce some of you um, to the larger group, so there's going to be that time to feel like you're connecting and getting to identify who you are, it's just we don't do that here in these, we consider these pre-workshops, pre-conference workshops, so that's how this goes. Um, so, I had one other um, <coughs> announcement. So, if you signed up for the conflict breakout session, our trainer is really sick and he's not going to make it. So, if you were in that one, um, go to the registration desk and we'll just get you in one of the other ones. Um, so, you can look at the different um, options. I know there's a facilitation one, networks as a policy tool, building relationships, and the um, collective impact one. So. All right, so I'm going to get started, um, and today we are, wait, where did Rob go? I got my screen up. Okay, <laughs> let's start, hold on. Oh, good. All right, so this, today we're talking about the partner tool, so this is a little bit hard in one way because this would be really helpful to do at the end of our NLTA, kind of after you've done everything, but we took a poll and nobody wanted to stay the extra day. So we said, well, sure, we'll just do it Monday morning. So it may seem a little out of context, especially following the 101, because this is kind of like after you've known a lot about what you would do with network data and what networks are all about. So keep that in mind, but just something, the good news about Partner is, if this is an ongoing thing. We do a demo every few months. Um, we have a technical manual, which is here and um, short videos on the website, all kinds of ways that you could learn about how to use Partner if you really want to. Um, so this isn't like a one-time shot, it's really going to be an introduction. Um, has anyone here used Partner already? Just a couple. Does anyone know what it is who hasn't used it? <laughs> okay, great. So let me start with what it is. Maybe you're wondering why you signed up for this. <laughs> so Partner is a tool. It's a social network analysis tool. And I'll, let me give you the history of it. So about 10 years ago, I used to work at the Rand Corporation. And I, at that time, had um, a director of, of our health policy group named Dr. Nikki Laurie. And Dr. Laurie came to me and said, hey, I know you've got network stuff. And there's a lot of people out in practice in public health departments that really are, uh, could use a tool like that. They're involved in partnerships, they're being asked to measure their work, they're, they need to know what's effective. Can't you make a tool? That's what she asked me. Can you make a tool for them? And, um, and I said, I think so. <laughs> we wrote a grant to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and with some really, really smart student brand, a really smart mathematician, we ended up building partners. And of course, like all grants thought, well, we'll build this, we'll show it, and then we'll move on, you know? But the thing is, it, was when we built the tool, we did it in a few ways. So one, we had a lot of users, meaning end users, we call them. So people who we found who were out in the community doing collaborative work, building networks, and we asked them to be a part of our work. And so they gave us tons of feedback, advisory councils, they tested it. So it's always been 
built in that um, spirit of making sure that it's something that everyone can use. And so for that reason, even today, people who use it will come and tell us all the time what they think would be better about it, and then we'll try to make those changes. Um, we also built it in a, the actual analysis tool I'll show you is in Excel. But we've never changed that. And I know we could get fancier and we could change in all kinds of ways, but this tool was built for practitioners, meaning people who are analysts, people who are running programs, and people who didn't necessarily want to learn how to do network analysis as a methodology. They just really needed a tool. And for that reason, we, well, we, we just didn't really know what else to do in the beginning. Um, but we left it in Excel because what happened is when we went to someone at a health department who was working on this stuff and we said, okay, we have this thing you can use, now open Excel. And everyone was kind of like, oh, okay, I can use Excel. You know how that works. So it's complicated kind of when you open it. It's a complex science thing. But the idea that you can open Excel and kind of get into that, we all know that. I'm sorry for the Mac users. It's not built for Macs. <laughs> um, so, so that's kind of the history of, of Partner. And so after the first year, and for two years at Grammy, a bunch of counties in New Jersey used it, and they kind of liked it. And then people kept calling us, wanting to use it, wanting to use it. And I ended up coming here to the university and just having tons of folks asking to use it. So in the first year, we knew all 12 people. In the second year, we knew kind of like all 30 groups, you know, using it. And now we just have lost track. So probably 80% or more of the people who use Partner we never interact with because we've built a technical manual. There's little videos to use it. It's designed that you can find it and use it. Um, it was always free until Robert Wood Johnson, after seven years, said, Danielle, we need to get a sustainability plan together, and we're going to have to wean you off of our funding. And so um, we charge $25 for students to use it and $50 for a nonprofit or public agency and $100 for a private uh, agency or evaluator who's getting paid. So we just do that to kind of keep it alive. And then um, people use it in different ways. Some people find it and they pay that fee and they use it and they figure it out. Other people say they want us to help them and we make a small contract with them and we'll do a project for it start to finish. And then we also have like funders who ask us to do really big projects like the Annie Casey Foundation, um, the Robert Johnson. We do uh, an evaluation of the Million Hearts Network for the CDC and the Assistant Secretary for uh, Planning and Evaluation. Um, we have a lot of projects. <laughs> We've done work in Colorado on the Early Childhood Council, so I'll talk about some of these examples. So, uh, but those are folks who basically are like usually funders and they fund networks and they want us to analyze the network or evaluate it. So, so that's kind of what Partner's all about. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of pick up where Brent left off just a little bit. Um, and a few of the things I'll say today, you'll see tomorrow when I do the network evaluation piece. So tomorrow I'll talk a lot more about, like, if you had network data, what would you do with it? How could you tell if network's working? What would you measure? But today is literally I'm going to do more of a how to use the tool. So that's why it's kind of backwards. So you might be like, why would I use this tool? So usually I'd, I'd like to go through the whole thing to tell you why it might be worth all the hard work. But I don't really get to do a lot of that today. So this is a lot more about using it. So if you have your computer, you can follow along. If you haven't already, you can um, register. So I sent everyone who registered for the session an email that said, if you would like, you can register for the um, to use the partner tool. So everyone who comes to NLTA gets one free survey to use. You can use it any way you want. Um, and if you use it as a practice, we can give you a real one after. But so about 20 people, I think, did that before today. So you would have gotten something that says now you're registered. So now you can log in if you've done that. But if not, you can do that later. All right, any questions? Is there anything anyone specifically wants to learn about partner? that you already know, you want to know? OK. All right. <laughs> I think that's good. So. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, oh, what time? Was it possible for <laughs> partner to generate a map without sending in the survey? No. Okay. Um, no, so this is a really good point. And, so, and I'll, I'll go over this. So using um, partner means collecting your own data. Um, and as we know, like collecting, if you've ever done this, collecting data from a, well, if you've ever collected data from a community, that's painful, right? If you've ever collected networking data, it's slightly more painful than collecting regular data, but which the return is just really great. And actually, uh, 
the response rate of partner surveys is about 60 to 75 percent, which seems really good, I think, given it can be kind of cumbersome. Um, and I'll say this in a minute, but it's, we've, it's been used, the survey's been given out at least 800 times. So that means 800 networks have used it. So we feel really good about the survey, and I didn't feel that way five years ago. Now I'm like, this survey's great because all these people are using it and it seems to resonate with them. So um, I'll talk about what it measures, though. So there are a lot of other tools to use network analysis, though, and most of them are fancier than ours, but they're designed more for researchers who um, want to build their own study, know how to put the data in, and know how they want to analyze it. This is all you'll see. It's very useful. Um, and we often, and if you do want to be fancier, you can always take the data out of Partner and put it into any tool, any network analysis tool. So and we do that almost always when we like write papers and things like that. All right, so, let's see if I can get this one. All right, so real quick, I'm gonna discuss, well, not really evaluating networks and systems, but a little bit about like the way that, that I kind of frame the way I think about why you would care, why you'd wanna do this. Whoops. And then the how to use partner, which is for EV stuff. <laughs> um, and then a looking at a little bit about how we communicate the results. We'll see how much we get through. So you'll see this tomorrow because I present this no matter where I talk. And if you've ever seen me talk, you've seen me present this. But this is kind of like my slide that describes everything that goes on at head. And I really geek about this, so I like this stuff. So, um, so what is really neat about this is that we use network science to guide everything. So network science isn't is 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 a field. It's an emerging field, and it's interdisciplinary. So whether you're in the physical sciences or the natural sciences or you're in social sciences, network science has concepts behind it, some of the kind that Grant was talking about that guide the thinking in that. But the neat thing about that also guides our practice, our work, and so I'm going to talk about how we can use some of those in practice. Um, so we, we started thinking about using this kind of methodology, network analysis, as an additional way to measure partnerships, um, because current assumption, and I've used the slide every talk I've done for 10 years, is that more is better, and it's still the same. <laughs> so almost no matter where we work and we connect with other people, we, uh, we work in this assumption whether we know or not that more connections are better. I mean, I always think back on, like, elementary school, you know, high school, when you knew that more ties to popular kids is just better you know, somehow. So we're, we're, like, ingrained socially to think that. But... There's an, there's an idea, an alternative, an alternative idea that less can be more. So maybe our relationships are quality, not based on how many connections we have, but the quality of them and the exchange that happens between. So I like these pictures at the bottom to think about this a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that Brent did. So see right here, let's say that's you, okay, and you're embedded in your own social sub-network. So we're all connected. So think about right now just like who you hang out with on the weekend you know, who you spend your time with. The people that we choose to hang out with are people a lot like us, right? They usually have access to similar resources. They like to go to the same movies, and maybe we share political beliefs. Maybe we go to the same church. Whatever it is, we surround ourselves with people we like to be around because they're usually a lot like us. Those are called our strong ties, and we're usually uh, well-connected to them. And everyone in the room has their own little social sub-network happening, but now we're all connected here through all these what we call weak ties. So Grant a better guy in the 70s, he did his dissertation on how people got jobs. He suspected that people got jobs because they knew other folks um, who knew things about jobs. But what he didn't know, which became such a foundational network science piece, was that people didn't get jobs from the people that we know really well because those people know everything we know about, right? So people got jobs from the people that we don't know as well. Those are called our weak ties, and we call this our strength of weak ties. So the advantage of connecting across these social sub-networks is that we can connect to people who know things that we don't know about. So a huge advantage to us in, in our personal lives, but in our work especially. So what's happening here is we can all connect to all these different people all the time, and it's kind of crazy and hectic, and that's okay, right? We have Facebook, and your email's probably going, and you're getting texts right now. Um, that's fine. But now, as a, now put yourself back in your organization's shoes, right? So now as an organization, same thing is happening, right? We have our strong ties that we know well for our organization. We're all being asked to do what Janice will talk about, the network way of working, working across boundaries. And it probably feels the same way. It's crazy, right? Emails and lots of meetings and lots of connections. And the problem now 
is that in an organization, it's not okay. It's not okay to have this kind of this kind of thing happening because we only have eight hours in a day, right? We only have this much of an organizational budget. So we have a different way of having to deal with our relationships and we have to manage them and we have to manipulate them. And so, for example, let's say here, I'm having trouble with this. Okay, now let's say here in this, in this world, there's another guy named Robert and he talks about structural holes. So he says, hey, this idea of weak ties is really good because it brings us things that he calls social capital. He says we get social capital from it. But we, he knew, he's from the business world, so he knows you can't go crazy, right? He's not from the nonprofit sector. We're just like, embrace everyone. He's like, we've got to make sure that our budgets are on tap. So he says, if we can reduce redundancy, reduce redundancy in our networks, we can have uh, more, we can take better, uh, we can have a collaborative advantage. So in this world, he says, what if we could connect to one person in each or organization, in each of those social sub-networks, that is the person we trust the most, they're like the gatekeeper that gets us connected to everyone else, so maybe this is a gatekeeper to a hard-to-reach population, and that's a funder to you know, a bunch of funding that we want. The idea is that, you know, we want to get there. We have to start over here. It has to always be can't have to get to know the network. But then people ask me, when I started doing this, do you use that principle? And at first I didn't. And now I do very, very carefully. I do very carefully about who I need to know different social networks. And I try to make sure after I kind of sort that out, I just keep one strong connection to each of them because I'm busy, you know. So if I'm, for example, I, when I came to Colorado, I knew I wanted to connect to school, um, the, uh, the public health, school public health. But I got to know who who, and I realized there's two people. I'm an advisor for our dual degree, so I need to know the academic person. And then in my research world, I know the one person over there that can get me anywhere in school. And school of is huge. And so those are the two connections I maintain. And I don't see, see anyone else on my emails to them unless there's a reason to. So it's really important to do this because your organizational, I call it your relationship budget, is limited, right? So, all right, so lastly here, what Bert says is if you do this, then you can free up your time to create new weak ties to new social subnetworks. So you have the greatest collaborative advantage. He called it social capital, and the reason that rubs me wrong is because we don't usually think of social capital as a person's thing, right? It's usually an organizational or community level thing. But, but Ron Burt refers to it as an individual social capital. So that's why I kind of say that. Okay, so if, if you leave today in this whole conference with nothing else, from my perspective, if you can start thinking this way, about how you can think about your social connections and how you might manage them and how you might reduce the number of connections but still have the highest quality uh, relationship or most amount of exchange, and you're now strategically thinking about that, then I think you've come away with something, okay? But number two, the, the, the real need right now is that you have to have data in order to do this kind of work because a lot of us think we can base this work on our assumptions and that's really false, because all we know is our perceptions of what's happening around us. So in this work I'm about to talk about, we measure a lot of perception. Because in network, the only true measure there is, is a perception of one another. So if the, the perception I have of you and you have of me is all that matters. There's no real relationship here that I can measure. So your perception is only one small part of that. So if I could start to understand everyone's perceptions here of one another and how that's changing over this set, the, these three days and how we end a year later, wow, you know, would I have all the data I need to manage people? You know? So that's the idea is that suddenly I get tons of information in order to make those decisions about how to just basically strategically think about managing a network. So I'm saying all that, and I'm going to be really clear. This is my, like, geeky world perspective. So over the next few days, you're going to hear a lot of different perspectives. We, we all agree on things, but Janice will talk about building a culture. When you hear Darren Hicks, you're going to be wowed because he talks about building a quality process. So I'm very, like, data-driven, you know? So some people kind of get, like, they tell me, I don't think data is a good way to think about managing our relationships. And that's, you know, there's other people that will speak to you even better. <laughs> so. All right, so this is the last one I'm going to do before just um, showing partner. Um, this is what I would call like the evolution of how a network works. And so this is kind of, I'm just going to drive this home that you can really do this work. So this looks kind of like dot matrixy because literally this is the first slide I ever put together probably 12 years ago when I started thinking this in my head and I was just trying to figure out how to talk to people about it. So I made this little graph and I've used it ever since. 
So this circle in the middle, see those nodes and the, and the squares? I'm sorry, the circles and squares? In that picture right here, where, see how they're laid out? In every picture around it, they don't move, maybe just slightly, but they, they're laid out the same. What's different in the four pictures are the lines that are drawn between them. So here's the deal. I call this the evolution of network building or systems building. So what happens in almost all networks, okay, so let's say you get funding from a funder and they say, build this network. So the first thing that happens is everyone identifies the powerful and influential people in the community and they ask them to come to a meeting. And here they all are at a meeting now and everyone kind of, you know, some people have been working together and some haven't. And you usually make a list of who's not at the table. You make that list and then the next meeting you invite the people who are on your list to the meeting. And here you are, inviting all those people. And then you come down here, and the strategy that we all work with is more is better. Let's get all those people to come to every meeting we possibly can as often as possible, right? And so we, most networks never leave this spot, and they just can't figure out why it's not working. So we're overburdening people, often not even giving them a role. We're not, confused, we're not clear why they're there, but we know they've got to be there, right? And there's like this feeling of desperation that people won't come to our network meetings. So here's what I would suggest, that you would move from here, after you become a network scientist, over to this spot, where you would think about your relationships in the way I just described. How can I manage these? How can I ask the fewest number of commitments from the fewest number of people and still get the best advantage out of building this network? So maybe it's that I build a small work group, that these people act as brokers. Um, let's say this is the core group, some work groups. Let's say these work groups only meet once a year. Who knows? Maybe every, you know, maybe once a year we all come together like this. Like, there's just different strategies. You have to have a lot of trust, right, in these people. You have to know they're the right people. They might leave. You need new people. So it's a lot about managing it. So what I would argue is that if you had data to do that, you could go back to your data and look at who perceives whom as what and how to kind of manage that world. This might feel uncomfortable to some of you or even just sound wrong, and that's okay. <laughs> but I just... I, I, this is, to me, the reason why you'd want to use a tool like Partner. And so, what I'm going to do is skip some of the next few slides, because um, you'll see them tomorrow. So, Brent really went over networks, defining what nodes and stuff are, so just really, really briefly, this is a methodology called social network analysis that I'm talking about. There are tons of ways to evaluate a network, this is one. What we focus on are these nodes. So you will each in my network here would be a node, okay? And I could ask each of you, who do you know? Who's a friend of whom? And how do you, what are you exchanging when you are relating? These arrows would show how you answered your survey uh, questions. Let's say in this network I ask them, who is a friend of yours on a scale of one to three, with three being the best friend and one sort of thing. Well, here we would see that Garth said he was a friend of Bill, and he gave him two. Bill did not say he was a friend of Garth, or he didn't answer the survey. Or he literally just doesn't define friendship the same way that Greg does. He just really doesn't think he's his friend. Um, lots of different reasons this could happen. So something to keep in mind is that context and the backstory to these networks is everything. So it's really important that you do collect network data from the community or your network, that you involve them in the process, you help them define the questions, you run it by them, you show them the results. We are only analysts in this way, you know, we don't really know the backstory of the network. And even if you are the person running your network, you don't know the whole network. <laughs> so it's important to make sure you keep context in mind. We don't really know why Bill didn't say with a friend of Garth. You'd have to kind of find out, unless he didn't answer the survey. So I'm not really going to go through this, um, what all these slides are, because Brent just did such a good job at that. But I always say, first thing you could do with network data is think like a network scientist. So sometimes this is all you need for your group, is to bring them a picture to get them talking um, about things. So maybe you don't need to go as far as manipulating relationships or managing relationships. But these, they come with pictures. I'm gonna show you that we don't use the picture very much, but everyone loves the pictures, right? So we, you could show those. You can answer research questions. I know we have researchers here. Um, we do that a lot. You can evaluate networks. So I'm going to talk about these things more tomorrow. Why, how you would do that. Um, and you can translate data to practice. So this is something in my center that we hold really strong as a principle, that we try to always help people think about how to use the data in their practice. It's really important, I think, otherwise people don't, are like, who cares? What's so what of these data? All right, so I'm going to talk about partner. Um, and what it is as a tool. So this is a website, if you haven't been there, partnertool.net. 
That's where you'd also go to register and get set up. Um, we actually have a new website, but basically PARTNER stands for the Program to Analyze, Record, and Track Networks, Enhance Relationships. Um, and I mentioned that we had support from Robert Johnson for seven years to build this tool, Robert Johnson Foundation. Um, we call it a quality improvement tool because of everything I just said. It is designed to give you data to inform your process and your process improvement. Um, so we also refer to it as evidence-based tool. Um, I will say to people as we're going through this and they're starting to think about ways they can manage their relationships and their networks, and I'll say, great, now you have evidence to do that. Without evidence to do it, we're basing all the work on our assumptions. Um, so it has a validated survey methodology. Um, the tool, the reference there means it actually has a tool. So the way that Partner works, and I'm going to go through this, is that you, there's a survey that you customize and you send it out to everyone in your network. Then when they answer surveys, you can get the data in any time. You load it into this tool, the Excel tool, and it does a certain amount of analysis for you, which is really nice to have right there. Um, the QI methodology I'll talk about more in the evaluation workshop, but um, it's basically a, a methodology that we use as a team to help. Um, I'll explain it real quick. When we go into a community, we don't just measure them. First, we usually go to them and as a group of stakeholders, we'll ask them to identify what their ideal network is. And we'll even use like thumbtacks and rubber bands and on board. You guys who get do this on Wednesday <laughs> is build these models of their networks and make it really real for them that we're measuring nodes and lines and things like that. And try to get them to articulate what kind of network works for them. What are they hoping to see? Because network data doesn't have a P value. There's no 100% that's the right network. And so get, this gives a context. Then we'll go measure usually, and then we can compare where they are to where they want to be. And that allows us to do really great action steps in that gap. So we don't always use that. It's a pretty intense process, um, but we, use, we do that. We actually have over 800 users in faith states in 31 countries now. Um, and to be honest, about 90% of them are in public health. Like our audience was public health. Our funding was all public health. There's nothing public healthy about the tool. It's just the context in which it's worked. What, what really is the way the tool works, it's for community network usually. So inter-organizational community networks. Although I've used it to measure people, <laughs> interpersonal networks. Um, you have to really modify the survey though to do that. Let me stop for a second. Are there any questions that I've asked before? Yeah. Does it work for all um, collaboration, like coordination? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll show you actually. So I'll show you how you would distinguish those the different types of collaboration in your method. Because that, that's the way I think about it. It works anytime you have, and I, I will talk about organizations, and this can be different, but you have a group of organizations that are working together. And then no matter what they do, you can use it. Okay, so um, I mentioned that practitioners use it. It wasn't designed for evaluators, but evaluators really like it <laughs> because it makes it really easy for them to do that work as well. Um, and researchers too, all the researchers are always asking us to make modifications and then we're like, go make your own tool. Um, so, but you know, we, we really believe in our survey and the, the measures are very validated now. So um, we really believe it's the best survey to do this kind of work I'm talking about. So the topic areas are diverse as the people in this room. And so I'll talk about this later today. I am just floored by the diversity of the group that's come to this year's NLTA. Um, I don't want to spoil, I don't want to do a spoiler on how cool that is because I got to save that for my talk later. But it is amazing. I wish I wish you could. You all will do this. You'll see this soon. But um, this is not even as diverse as you are. The topic area of the network is. There's no criteria for that. You could be working on anything. You could be doing suicide prevention or emergency management. What are some of the networks that you all, what's the context of the networks you work in? Just throw them out. Adolescent well being. Stigma reduction and behavioral health. Financial, Financial security. Financial security and climate literacy. Climate literacy. We're all my environmental national parks people. <laughs> There's like six of you here. So what are your, we all want to know, what are you guys working on? 
Right. We're an employee resource group inside the National Park Service called the Innovative, Innovative Leadership Network. And so we're really working on trying to change that, change the top down communication so that we have more bottom up communication from the bottom to the top. Because really inside, your organization? inside your organization? Nice. Uh -huh. And we're doing that by um, involving employees that are involved in project. And we're working with a, a small network and growing. Yeah. Yeah. So this is neat because you guys have a little bit of a different twist on on um, the networks too. But don't worry, I'm lost. This this you could use this in that way because you're still thinking of. It's harder to use an interpersonal network like a friendship network, but I'm working it. Anyone else? Special education. Special education. Great. Okay. Well, so any of these topics would would work, right? Okay. Uh, and we've, we've so so we've had the the survey translated into five languages, um, and we just had a new group um, starting to use it on human trafficking, which is going to take it into some new countries that it hadn't been on in new languages. So pretty neat to see it grow. Um, okay, so this is this is a lot of information here. Basically, what this means is that because we we own this tool, so when people use it, unless they tell us not to, we take the data and it's all anonymized and it goes into this huge data set. So as a professor, this is great news. Right? So we have an 800 um, network data set, which is the biggest whole network data set that exists. And the reason we know that, I mean, there are bigger network data sets, but they're data mined. This is the only one collected with the same survey um, and the same methodology. Oh, and you know, there's some differences, you'll see in the questions people ask, but basically it allows us to look across huge networks to, to do some, ask, answer some research questions about networks and really learn about networks. And so we don't even have the capacity in our center to analyze all the data that we have. So it's just really remarkable. So a lot of different ways we can look at it. That's what this is saying. All right, and last thing here, what makes it different from other tools? So you're probably gonna look up after this, you should, all kinds of other tools. Another great tool is called UCINet. You might have seen UCINet. UCINet would be the one that most people use, and it's literally U-C-I-N-T. The difference is UCINet is an analysis tool. So you have to go make your own survey, bring it into the tool, <clears throat> decide how to analyze it, um, and so you have a lot of new ways to analyze it. So, and it's, it's, so it's a little harder uh, just to pick up and use. So the reason partner is kind of neat is it comes with a survey. You get the, I'm going to show you this. You get the survey, you customize the questions, you put in your network numbers, and then you just send it out. So it, it's a, the survey is validated. We really leave, we ask the fewest number of questions to do this enormous amount of analysis that I'm talking about. Um, thanks to the analysis tool, so there's no data cleaning, which is a gem. Um, no need to develop new analysis plan each time, and there's the ability to export to other programs. And then it's flexible, but with enough formatting to be user-friendly, meaning that there's some things that aren't changeable on the, in the tool. But that's because when you use it, it automatically imports to this Excel file, so it has to know how to read all that data in. Um, so, yeah. so with a lot of our big projects that I talked about, like our Annie Casey projects or our federal projects, they'll ask for modifications to the tool, and we'll make the tool, and then we'll release it to everyone. So that's we like have no investor in this. We're just the university department. This makes no money at all. But we're really committed to like making it work. Kate is here. She works as one of our um, folks on on my team, and um, you know we're we're just really committed to making it work for people. So okay, so how it works? So just like any survey, one person usually is administering the survey at a computer is how it works, <laughs> and then you have to ask everyone in your network to answer. Survey. So of course, people are not all going to answer the survey. If you can get 100%, that's terrific. Um, if you can't, you just do the best that you can. One thing, if you're doing research, it changes a little bit whether you have everyone, the response rate matters a little bit more. The reason I kind of say it's okay if you start not getting everyone to respond is, I mean, you won't know everything about your network, but you know a lot more than you knew before. So if you're using this for practice, that's really key. Um, and usually once you show your network what you have, they all want to answer because <laughs> they see themselves in it. Yes? So is it the only way to do it is on the computer? No, and a lot of our foreign language takers, um, 
we have a paper version of the survey, and so like if there's a survey with multiple languages, people have translated it into multiple languages and then given a paper survey, and then you would just have to take it, come back, and enter each one. But what we have you do is enter it as though you're taking survey, so it still automatically exports. Um, yeah, so that's it's a little harder intuitively to see how it goes, but for some people that's easier though too. Yeah, yeah. What's the most guys? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, for research, um, I'll just start there real quick. So we've done some studies where we'll like run statistics and we can run it down to like a 25% response rate and it won't change our statistics. Um, meaning that like it, it won't change whether something was statistical significant or not. So we can run it really low and, and um, but for, for practice, for looking at your network, then um, it kind of depends. So if you look at it and you just realize that, you know, no one, Brent calls them the toxic nodes. I know he said you'll hear me say that and I never call anyone a toxic node. But if you, let's say you have toxic nodes and you, like, you know they're not answering your survey, you know, you might feel like we have to get their information. Um, I've never had anyone flat out say, like, we threw it all out because not enough people answered. So, um, yeah, we always use the data. Um, one of the things also, so you get information almost on every node in the network, unless, you'll, I'll show you an example where there's sometimes you get isolate. So I, like, we might have a relationship and I might say that we're friends, I say something about you and you might not answer the survey, but we can assume there's a relationship and I'm not completely making it up, you know? So um, we can account for relationships that way, so, yeah. What about networks in my own network? So when you have one main business sit out to their network and then have those networks in their network and provide all the same data that come back to one so, so let me explain the next few steps, and then okay. you'll kind of see why that's tricky. Um, so there's a there's my, my like immediately I would go probably not because of one thing you're the bounding the network part, but I might not. You could also probably work it to do that. Um, let me explain something, and you'll see. I think you'll get a hang of this in a second, and we can come back to that. Um, so when you register on the partner tool, you'll get something that says, now you're registered, and you're going to be like, what am I supposed to do? When you log in, you're going to see a screen like this. So it has these four steps. So really, truly, partner takes four steps to finish. But let me talk about them, because they aren't necessarily so easy. So step one, now this is the absolute hardest step of the whole process. Um, and you may not have trouble with this, so it could be really easy, but most of you would. And that's okay, it's really normal. One thing I would say is this is what I would call systems you know, analysis, systems evaluation, and it's really, really hard to manage a system. It's really hard to understand a system, and it's really hard to measure a system. So if you're not in, into it, you should probably get out of the business of managing a system. I, I say this to all of our funders when they're kind of like, we're not gonna do all this work. I think, well then why are you funding systems and networks if you're not going to do the hard work to also manage and evaluate? Okay, so the first step is that you, the manager, that's the person who signs up, we refer to you as the manager, you have to bound the network. So bounding the network means that you have to identify who's in your network. And those are also the people that you're going to usually send the survey up to. The example I'm going to give is, is, a, is a diversion from that, but this is the idea. So let's say you've got 25 people in your network, they each represent an organization, you put them in this list I'm going to show you, you fill it out, uh, get all the information that you need in there, and you upload it into the tool. So you can imagine why this is starting to get hard, right? The, the first thing you might be thinking is, well, what about those people that don't come? What about the people that we were hoping would be in our network next year? Do we include them? Um, you know, what about the fact that we have 10 people that come from the uh, nursing association? Can we include all 10 of them? And so... And then the last, the last kind of dilemma, too, is what if I have 500 people that I want to include in my network? So this is really hard work, and it can't be arbitrary. Um, we're doing a federal project right now, and you'll know this if you are federal. OD says, right, you can have like nine people you interview before you go through the OD process. So they've defined their network by nine. So they don't have to go over that, which is the worst way to ever define a network. Um, so, so this is just really hard. And... So let me start with the, the large size problem. So when you send a survey out to people, eventually question 10 they see and it gives that list. You can ask them on that question 10 to reduce the long list of network members by only picking those they have a relationship with. 
And the idea is that you get them to pick a smaller part of that list. The next eight questions, they ask questions, they answer questions about those that the people they picked. It's a matrix, so it's eight screens. But that's the, that's the essence of the network survey. That's what makes it a network survey, are those we call them relational questions. So the longer that list is, the harder it is for people to take the survey, and the lower response rate you'll get. So a real balance here. Um, so it's something to think about. But most, on average, the, the network size in the partner tool are about between like 30 and 50. I know that's a big range. But that's pretty normal size. Those surveys take about 15 minutes for people to take. Um, it's pretty reasonable. We don't. We have an, we have a, another whole group that go to between like 80 and 100, and they get done too. It's pretty amazing how well networks can um, get done. And we've even had people with really small networks actually use it. We have a, a user who's been using it for probably 10 years. She works for JSI in New Hampshire, and they're using it again right now. And she's had a network of six in there. And the, the interesting thing about that is I know she knows what she's doing. So she picked to have six in there, and it worked really well for her. <laughs> so. Lots of range in the size, things to think about. You can only have each row of your respondent sheet can only have in the, in the organizational name column one unique organization name. So if you have three people who come from that organization, you really need to pick one to answer the survey. Because each of those becomes a node, and you can't, when they, the person sees it on the survey, they're just going to see the organization mentioned three times. They won't see the, per, the different people. So sometimes people will write an organization name and their department. So we'll mind it or by programs. So that's okay. Yeah. So we had an organization this year who wanted to have their three people reach the center. Oh, on taking the survey? Okay, good. Uh huh. So you mean they took it together? Did it work? Not really well. No? What happened? I suspect this much when you call up interviews and basically the boss always won. Oh, yeah. The boss Just wasn't necessarily. So oh, such a great point. Because the last point you said is so important because a lot of times we'll do a survey where we think we want the boss as the person, and it's not it's the program people, it's the administrative assistants that know what's happening. Yeah, that is a real dilemma. People are really tough. <laughs> um, <laughs> like uh, you know, I, I say that because kind of having to laugh a little because it's just not a perfect science. I mean, nothing really is, but. Um, I saw someone once do their survey with that as the intention of the survey to try to understand how the boss saw things different from the, she called them the worker bee. <laughs> um, she would list the organization and, and the two positions for every organization she did that. I can't remember how it turned out. I don't know if we followed up. We worked with her a lot on developing that um, methodology for herself. So. Our solution for next year yeah. is to have the boss have the run. Nice. Mm -hmm. Do their own. Yeah. So see, you. What's your name? David. David. Okay. So you can see David talking about how they're dealing with networks inside networks or bigger connections. So um, it's a little, that's why it's not a straightforward answer. Our friend in um, New Hampshire, she came to us one time and she's like, I've got a region and then I've got communities inside a state. And she was like, I want to measure them all. So we, and, and this is the one she knows what she's doing. She was using partner when it was like the clunkiest thing I've ever, I can't believe she stayed with us. Um, so she, uh, she constructed, this is getting really nuanced, but like one survey that included every person in all those three layers, but only asked like 10 people to take that survey. Those people got a survey with like 200 organizations. But she knew those 10 people well, and she said, let me explain what I'm trying to do. She got them to take it. Then she gave the, she broke up the networks to take it a different way, and then together we combined all the data. Um, we had to help her with that at the end into one big file. So there's some ways it can get messy. Yes. Uh, I, I see that it's a great tool for looking at uh, what you already know, but is there any room for discovery? Like, say we have five representatives of organizations that work with, I don't know, Walter White, and I don't know Walter White. Is there any place they could identify that as like a potential additional node? Yeah. I didn't know they were already connected to. So there's two ways that you would collect network data, and the one I'm talking about is called a bounded network approach, where you know the network ahead of time. The other alternative is called a name generator, where you ask people to list their partners. So that's your question, who are our partners? This isn't really the right time to use partner tools. We actually, you can, you, you can pick, to, you can. We can pick to do a name generator version of it and let people list. The reason I said you can't is because 
it's so much work. I mean, it is enormous amount of work to clean those lists. So much so that, like, unless someone really knows what they're doing, we just, we don't, because then we're helping <laughs> later. Um, it's better to get that work done before you come to these partners. So what we do do, though, so on some, we have a survey out right now. We have a question at the end. Um, you can add any questions you want after question 18, where we ask them, are there partners that weren't listed here? We just don't get to ask them all the relational questions about each one. And we can deal with that extra data ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah, you can, or you like use them next time. Um, what we would encourage you to do is use that approach as a separate study, you know, go through either key informants, like pick five to 10, whatever it takes, key informants to ask them who all those extra people are, get them to review your list, um, you know, maybe even send a little survey out to people who are your partners ahead of time, you know, but then you're surveying them twice, whatever it is. But so the best way to do it is with the bounded list. It's the most valid, it's the most reliable, um, but it doesn't answer that question. So it's a, and that's a question, I mean, I could guess a third of you in the room have that question. Who's part of my network? That's why this process, I'm spending all this time on it. It's so hard. It, even though I'm saying it's hard, you'll start doing it and you'll be like, this is so hard. Like, you'll feel like cheated, like you didn't know it was going to be so hard. It's so hard to do this part. It's just that conceptualizing what our networks are is not as clear as we think it is, you know. Unless you are that person who's got your list ready to go. And we've had people get find partner and the list is out and they have to go in the next day. Yeah. I was just going to comment to the bounded versus generator style surveys. Yeah. That, I mean, there are other tools that help survey broader groups of people. I've solved that issue because I do a lot of surveys internal to our company. And so I can actually do like a discovery name generator based off of a predetermined list that we just don't know who's in a given network within our company. So I use like an HR list that might be appropriate in that function. What's the tool that you use for that? So I use I use Q survey and then we've got a custom JavaScript. I'd be happy to show you, but it, it lets you do type ahead, like insert stuff. Um, and then it limits. So we've got So you're still loading the list in ahead of time. Yeah, and so the key is that I'm looking to pick a group of six thousand people, but you can pick any one of that those six five hundred people discover instead of starting with like a seed list of Projects. They love the name gener generator. We're just finishing one on the. Um, we did two versions of the sur survey of her, uh, recovery networks after Hurricane Sandy, and they use name generator. And it's just it's just such a pain because you have to. I mean, so this is what happens. Someone writes like Colorado Department of Health, and someone else writes uh, Colorado Department of Health of uh, Early Childhood, and you have to decide is that one known or is that two known. And then so or someone writes John Smith, and someone else writes J Smith, and suddenly you're like. Of the same person or not. So, I mean, it just goes on. Yeah. <laughs> it, it'll take like six months to clean that. But um, so that's a resource that, so you'll hear about this later. We have this Padlet site so we can put new resources that we don't even know about up on that for everyone to see and find later. So, um, is that tool, do you pay for it? Does your company? Yeah, we can talk about it because there are also oh. some other, other tools. Yeah. What's your name? John Wanderers. John, and where are you? What are you from? I'm from MWH Global, big construction. <laughs> See how cool. So find John if you want some extra <laughs> tools during the next few days. Like he knows some stuff. So good. Okay, let me go on to step two. We got through. This is really the hardest. Was that any more questions? Yeah. Okay. You, you mentioned that someone was with the network, so I understand correctly you asked them how long they've been in the network, so if their responses are lower or more negative, do you think that's appropriate to include that? Because the length of time that they've been the network is reflected, so it kind of shows that you're yeah. starting to build that. So, and I'm going to go right into the survey questions now. So what you just said is why context is so important, right? So you could interpret that because you know the context behind that person. So that could be really important. The other thing, though, I wouldn't underestimate just because someone's new that they 
they might not have an accurate perception. Um, sometimes we assume that people are there longer, could have a more accurate perception of the network, but I tell you the only real measure is the perception. That's a real measure that person has right then, and I wouldn't really discount it ever. Uh, but let's talk about the, the survey question. So the survey is, so the survey this is kind of the next hardest part because it's the next hardest thinking part, but it's all here for you, it's a tool. So there's really 19 standard questions, and so one through nine are gonna be questions where someone answers it about their organization or their organization's perspective on what's been achieved or what they can contribute. And then questions um, 10 through 18 are the relational questions. After that, you can add any multiple choice or open-ended questions that you want. Um, it's up to you. Um, so this is really hard to see, but I will go through them anyway. So you can open this, um, all of these resources are on the partner website under the partner <coughs> tool under resources. What I didn't just show you, and I'm going to go ahead and skip, is the actual worksheet that you fill out to bound your list and the fields you'll see you have to do it. There's tons of it, uh, directions. Um, this is the survey, and this is written. So if you want, um, we only printed 15 of each of these, but like here's the survey as a Word document so you can see it. And there's also, we printed some of the technical manuals and one of our, um, a brief kind of about the, the thing. Up here you can take these. Um, so the questions, the first nine, what you see here, the first one, it always, it's just identifies the, the person, the respondent, and they don't actually have to answer it. So the first question you'll see, it says, what's your job title? And it's an open-ended response. It can be any question. It just has to be an open-ended response. Question two says, how long have you been in that position? It can be in any, it can be any question, but the answer has to be numeric. See, so this is what that part where it's flexible, not flexible. <laughs> um, so question four and five, so question four, it usually is asked, what, do you can, what can you contribute to the network? You're asking the partner what they contribute or could contribute if you're new. And then the next question asks them to pick the one thing that is their, uh, they consider to be their best contribution. You can word these any way you want, but it has to go that way. Multiple choice, pick any, pick one. Okay, now questions six and seven do the same thing, but usually people ask about outcomes. They try to get a sense from the network what outcomes have been achieved. This is different, right, from measuring how many kids did we vaccinate through a vaccination coalition, you know, or something like that. It's, we're not really talking about those hard number outcomes. We're talking about some of the process outcomes or what people know is happening at their own organizations that can contribute to the work of the network, getting a larger perspective on it. So we'll ask about that. You can, ask, you can put any responses in, and then the next one usually says, what was, what's the most important thing we've achieved? These two are usually about some perception of success. Um, and you can change them again, the wording and everything, just not that they, they have to be multiple choice. So usually we'll ask how successful has the network been in achieving its goals, and then you have to define what the goals of the network are. This question right here has the most variance of any question in the whole partner survey across all the networks, which is so interesting to us because what we see over and over again is that in networks, people don't agree on what success is. And so you get like a third saying we're really successful, half saying somewhat, and a third probably didn't add up, but you know a third saying not successful. And at first we thought this is just a bad question, but we think it's something very different. We think that we all spend a lot of time on vision and mission and all that stuff, right? But we rarely ask people in our network or help them define what success is. So some people are thinking success is we went home and we had a great meeting. Right? And then other people are like, well, we had a great meeting. We didn't move the dial on childhood obesity. You know, so people think success is something different. So what I always say is unless the network can agree on what success is, you are never going to get there. So when you see networks that are all, we look at agreement on the outcomes. So when everyone agrees that the network's been really successful, that's great, right? When everyone agrees that the network's not been successful, that's really good too. Because to have a group of diverse organizational partners that all agree on something, especially as important on what success is, is a high functioning network. Now the challenge is to get to make change that to be successful. When you've got a network, when everyone says something different, that's when you got your hands full. You gotta really work on that. Um, okay, the relational questions, super hard to see. So I mentioned question 10 is the first one where they'll see the long list and then they have to from that list. So you want to get them to eliminate how many people they're going to answer the next set of questions about. So there's two default questions in the survey. 
frequency of interaction and type of relationship. So the frequency is, you know, how often do you interact? This you'll see here towards your question earlier, there's a scale of cooperation, coordination, and integration that people can say, you know, what they do. We sometimes use these. We, some, we never use frequency, to be honest, anymore. It just doesn't, it's not helpful in any of our work. But almost, if you uh, do network analysis, everyone bases everything on frequency. The reason I'm kind of blowed off, imagine the people who you're strong, strongly connected to. And when's the last time you talk to them? Versus all the people that you talk to every single day, and you're probably not very, you know, strongly connected to them in the same way. So it's so, so many areas. In our survey, we have this online. We offer, like, I don't know, I think there's six to eight now, variations on relational questions you could ask. So one of the ones I'll talk about tomorrow that's really popular now, really, but it's so important, is an attribution question. So why did this tie start? And can we attribute it to an intervention, a funding, you know, a program? And so um, we usually ask that now, or we'll ask, what do, what do you do when you partner with someone? What's the activity? Or we'll ask, um, just a lot of, there's a, I can't think of them all. What's the, what's the outcome of that relationship? So you can put two in here, any two that you want. And then if you want, you can add more here at the bottom. But you just don't want to make it too long. So the next set of questions are kind of our core partner perception questions. So the first one is perceptions of value between partners. So as you know, whenever we get a group of people together, we need to identify who needs to get there. We want to know who's going to be valuable right, to the work. What happens is most people identify a powerful and influential people and you invite them to the table. We don't know what the role is. We don't even know if they're going to come to every meeting, but they've got to be there, right? Um, but there's other ways that people, we did a lot of qualitative work to get these measures 10 years ago. Um, so this is a scale of value. So people rate each other on power and influence, resource contribution, and level of involvement. What we know is that there's some folks that are really involved in these community networks, and they have no power and influence and no resources. And we often overlook them as potential facilitators and key players in the network. We often use the same people as everyone else in every other network to lead our networks and be those faces of the network. You can imagine how troubling that is, and you, we've had networks really wonder why they're not making any progress and it's often because they're they're just tapped out they just don't the same people are doing everything so we encourage people to use these data to try to find perceptions of like this who's really involved and really get those people to come um, into the network in a different way and then we measure trust but we never say who do you trust on and this is a scale a four-point scale they answer on measures of reliability mission congruence and communication so reliability is something we were never surprised by. We learned people, you know, define trusted relationships as. But in these diverse networks, we're saying connect with all these diverse people with all these diverse organizational missions. So the degree to which people perceive the people in the network are also aligned in the mission um, is often a proxy for trust. So you might wonder why Walmart is at your table, but if you believe that they're there for the same mission, you'd have a different feeling of trust for them. This is not unlikely in small town. <laughs> um, and then communication is really, you know, imagine you're at a meeting and you're all talking and everybody's open and then suddenly that person comes into the room and sits down and you're like, oh. you know, you just know you can't say what you really wanted to say anymore because the communication has changed. That happens in our networks also. So we measure those things and then we use those in our quality improvement work. All right. So a couple more things, collecting the data. The partner tool has a feature that you go in and you can just go into the email function. You can um, send the introductory emails, the invitation email, and the reminder email through the partner tool. Sometimes that gets filtered because it comes through an email system, so we would encourage you to also send emails through your own email system. But it provides a link to people, so you can send that. So just, you asked this question, and I don't even think you meant this when you said it, but one thing you'll never want to do is you never forward an email invitation to someone else. It's specific to each organization. But we've made it really easy. They don't have to log in. They click the link. and I mean, they hit go into the survey. And it starts. Um, and then you can upload the data from the partner tool right onto your desktop and then load it into the file. I want to show you um, how this works before we have to end. We might go over a few minutes here. So, okay. <clears throat> Two things first. So, let's do this. I'm going to go to the partner tool.net website. 
And I'm going to show you, this is what it looks like. So you can see all the different things. If you go to partner tool here, this is where you find the actual analysis tool. You log in the resources and so on. Um, if you click here, after you register, you'll be able to log in. So um, uh, let me see. So I just logged in as a manager. And when I log in, I see this screen and it lists all my surveys. You guys will just have one. So I'll click on one of these demo ones, and then I'll see the four steps. I can do things like I can download the respondent um, worksheet that, hold on. You pinning this? Not my computer. Um, there. This is the worksheet that you'll fill out to bound your network right here. So you can find it there. It'll give you instructions on how to, how to load it. Um, if I click here, I can see all the respondents I have in there and I can edit them. I just use this for a demo, so it's just gonna look funny. After I finish that step and I've done all that hard work, I go to survey, modify survey. Um, you can change the consent language and the instructions if you'd like. You can use the standard default survey, which are the language that you'll see when you open those the survey. Most people at a minimum change it to be work for their community. Um, if you customize it, you go, you go question by question to customize it here. Don't forget to save it. Um, and then um, you can also, if you're managing multiple, which lots of communities run like 16 surveys at a time, so they can get one all right and then um, copy them over. Um, and then after you do that, you can <coughs> send emails. So you can send the introductory email and all of the emails, when you create it, you'll pick who you want to send it to. You can write the subject line and the, the body in. Um, on the invitation email, it has a section that you cannot modify. Oh, I don't have any to send, so it's not showing me. There's a section you don't modify, which has um, the link and the, you know, that link that populates for them. And then you can send in um, reminder emails. So like we're running one right now, we're doing evaluation of the Baltimore Integration Partnership and they are doing their network survey right now. So we go through that and see who's answering, who has it, send them the reminders. All right, so what I wanna do now is I'm gonna open, I'm gonna try to do this live. So hopefully this doesn't mess up. This is the actual partner tool. After you do all the work on the um, computer, you can go in, you, you, you tell them to give you Sorry, I skipped step four, which was to analyze your data. So you'll analyze your data. It'll give you a file that pops up. You save it on your desktop, and it's going to look like, sorry, I'm having trouble getting this, but it's a little text file like this. You just save it somewhere. It has all your data in it. I can show you. You never need to open that. Whoops. Sorry. Okay, but what I'm showing you here is that I'm going to... So this is what the partner tool looks like. So I told you it's in Excel. So you're like, what is this thing, right? I clicked the enable buttons at the top. You have to do that. But I, the first thing I would do is go manage my data. So I'm going to upload my survey data. I'm going to go find that little file that I saved. So you can do this, you know, after the first day, and you'll be like, who answered my survey? And you get it in. So one of the, it says I successfully did my work. So these buttons work like an online tool. The first thing I could do is I could go look over here and I can see who answered my survey and who didn't. Um, this is where all the data, some of the data sit. Um, we, it gets shown up as dummy variables over here. I'll explain why it doesn't look like there's a lot in here. If you modify the questions, they all show up here, all the modifications, you can kind of check it. Um, but on that introduction tab, the first thing I might want to do is create an app. So this is why it's Different from other tools, it's just the analysis is ready to go. You don't have to figure this out. So the first thing I would do is say, who do I want to show? This is a data set that um, is from a health department, and the health, this is, so this one's a little different. The health department, they did bound their network. They picked, it's a huge health department, and they said, we want to work on early childhood stuff. And we know there's a ton of programs in our health department that are doing this work, but they're not working together. So we're going to start network of those internal health department programs. But at the same time, we know they're connected externally to the community. 
So their bounded list had all the community organizations that they think they connect to, plus their internal programs, but they only asked the internal folks to answer the survey. So they could understand how they work together inside the health department, and then how they connect to their community partners. Does that make sense? So that's a little different. What it looks like is a ton of people didn't answer the survey, but that was the intention. Okay? So I'll show you how that turned out. So I'm going to pick, um, I don't have to pick these two. I want to, we labeled them as public health and then other. And so these were folks, um, okay, so I'll put different colors. We'll show those two things. And I'll go ahead and show the names of the organizations, but they're coded here. This is a decision you'll make. Do you want to show your network, name, you know, the names or not? Up to you. If I hit display network, okay, that looks just messy, right? All right. So let me show you intuitively why this isn't necessary. So you can make it a little smaller if you do that. I'm going to actually turn the names of the organizations off for a second. Okay, so the pink nodes are the internal health department nodes, and the red nodes were the community nodes. So you heard Brent talk about birds of a feather flock together. We call that homophily. So we would expect the people inside the health department, right, to all flock together in a way. And then the red nodes are community partners. But what was kind of interesting here is that those pink nodes aren't all clumped together. They are connected, but they're really well embedded in their community, which is what they suspected. None of this was really new for this department, but they had evidence now from which they could plan how to move forward. So they saw how connected these pink nodes were to their community, um, which was a lot. And so, okay, if I go, so that's how you just map out those. If I go to the relationship tab. Now, keep in mind, all those questions this went through, they all lead to this. And you didn't have to clean it, it was really nice. If I click here, you're going to see all the relational questions that you picked. So if you add 10, you're going to pick 10, but respondents are going to hate you. <laughs> um, so we usually have two or three. So the first question um, was question 11, um, and it asked uh, how often they interacted. So I can, I can do some of these fancy things, like show the strength of the ties or the directions of the ties here. I can look at at least or exactly in my answers. Sometimes these aren't, they don't build up on each other. So at least won't make sense. Here at least makes sense. So if I said this is at never or at least never, which means any anybody who picked anyone is there. If I want to go to every few weeks, I can see there's fewer interactions. And of course, as expected, every week it's fewer. And these are actually a lot of the internal you know, ties you see. So fewer interactions with the community, more internal. Nothing too too amazing, surprising there. They also asked the question of, actually this is where we got the scale. This health department trains on collaboration, um, like working together on scale towards integration. And I, I don't think they do that anymore because I think they realize integration isn't always the goal. This is the more is better approach. Integration takes a lot of resources and a lot of time. So um, let's say none, let's say so if I update it, if I hit display network, it's going to lay them out in a different way again. So you can see the ties are back here. So I'm going to go over here to attributes. So remember they rated each other on the different perceptions of value and trust. So here, if I hit overall value and I go like this, the nodes get bigger when their perceptions of by their partners were higher. So what we, it's hard to see. And this remember I said we don't use the pictures very much because the, the data behind it are much more interesting. Tomorrow I'm going to show you a lot more about how to like communicate and show these data and use the, the numbers. Here what we saw was that while the pink nodes got big, um, the red nodes got really big too. So there was a lot of value perception of their partners um, outside of the health department. And if I step through these, all of them rate each other somewhat high on power and influence. You'll see some of these small ones. Some of them didn't get picked. Um, level of involvement really varied on how they perceive involvement, but this isn't that uncommon. Resource contribution, you saw them kind of shrink which means what's happening in this network is the perceptions of the resources that folks are, the resource contribution of partners is, is low. Um, it doesn't happen in every network, but in some, it's, it's just hard to try to understand how the resources are being leveraged. Um, okay, and just lastly here, trust. The good news is they have much higher perceptions of each other on trust. And then, of course, there's the three dimensions. The last thing I'll show you here, I told you on question four, People typically ask what they contribute to the network. So let's say this. So remember, only the pink nodes answered this. That's why there's no ties between the red nodes very much, uh, or at all. Uh, when the, the node turned to um, striped like that, it meant that person said, I bring that to the network. 
It's not going to be that interesting here, but when you get a big network, you start to see how resources are embedded in networks. So are they really dispersed or are they clustered? And what is it that you want them to be? Do you want them clustered or do you want them dispersed? So you can kind of start to see that. And then we also ask what's uh, like, what's their most important contribution? So only these nodes answered. These shouldn't be green. Our programmer needs to make them white again. I don't know. He, last time he got hands on this, he made them green. But um, <laughs> so these, so you can see that the keys over here, people said what they thought their most important contribution was. So this is how you can really, as a manager, leverage these things. You know, hey, you said that facilitation was your most important contribution. Can, can you bring that? You know, can we have you do that? Really get people to, to own up to that. And then lastly down here, Wow. Um, you can look at some scores. You can imagine when we first did this, because we're researchers, we like peppered it with all kinds of crazy scores, and our practitioners said, that's just too much. You've lost me. Like, I don't want to open that. This is very minimized. There's only three whole network scores here. Um, and then there's scores by organization, so the raw values of these things. So let me pick one, for example. Well, let me just do this. So for example, on the, on the perceptions of power and influence, there's a whole number of nodes they included that nobody picked. So these are community members that they had no connections to, no one reported connections. But let's say here, I'm trying to pick one that, all right, look at this person. So um, this person, when their partners rated them on these different dimensions, so on, for example, their power and influence, their, uh, really high power and influence, really low on involvement, and really low on resource content. So this scale goes, uh, one is not at all, a two is a small amount, a three is a fair amount, and a four is a great deal. So we consider between three and four good. And anything between below three starts to fall into a fair amount. But look at their trust scores are really high over here. So the question here is never, should we all be, uh, shouldn't be, should we all be at four? You cannot manage a network where you want everyone to be the best at everything, right? The real question is, what do I need from that partner? And maybe I need that partner, power and influence. We really trust them, and they're not very involved, and that might be just perfectly fine. <laughs> we, the best thing for that network member may be to make sure we never ask them to a meeting that they cannot figure out why they're there. So the less involvement they have, maybe the more we'll get out of them. So this is how, as a manager, you'd start to manage or manipulate right, these data. <laughs> and then you can look at it really nuanced over here on the data tab. You can look at what any one organization said about another organization, or you can start to group them. Like, well, what did everyone say about this one organization? And you can even find organizations where there's a lot of variance. Some people said good things, and some people didn't, and just so much information. So, but you might not want to go there either. You don't have to. Um, okay, I'm going to end there because I was going to show you some ways we we you know, uh, put it all together and give it back to folks, but I'll come back tomorrow because I want to make sure we have a break. So, um, but first, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, so, if you're working with a rural community and someone has um, working on open development, so open and you want everyone involved around within that community, how would you overlay that? So, so the question was, if you have a rural development initiative, yeah. right, and you have a community that is pretty big, I mean, a lot of people involved, yeah. a lot of folks involved, and there's different ways they inter interact. What I would do, so in, both, in the other question you asked as well, I think that the survey, by customizing the survey the right way, you'll, that's the way you'll get to that. So if you make sure, we can, we can even talk about this if you really want to do this. If you customize your survey so that you're making sure your question is going to help answer that, the, the survey question is going to help you answer what you want to do, you can force them to respond by which, which part of that network they're in, and then you can visualize it. Like over here, I could have just picked when I um, created my network map, I could have picked over here just to show, like, just public health, for example. So you can take, if, that's, a, I guess, another way to answer that. You would take, we, you, you give them an attribute by a group, we call it. So you could give them an attribute by their different groups, and then you can show just networks by their group as well.
Well, what is there like in public health and like? So I would call, I would say that's a coding thing, right? Yeah. So you got to start to figure out where, or it's one of the other questions you would ask them to identify from this list which they are in, and then so those kinds of attributes you have to decide how to use them later. But the attributes help us explain the network. Okay, I'm just gonna say this: if anyone wants to use Partner, you can email partnertool at ucdenver.edu. You'll meet Sarah during this, so Sarah is the one who manages the whole partner tool and all of our users. And um, we have people come to us all the time trying to sort through things, and we're pretty responsive. Kaylee does the same thing. Um, and so we're just a, a team. I'll, I'll tell you this. Our mission is to build your capacity to do this. So I told you we don't make any money off of this. If you, What we're hoping, if, when most people come to us and say, like, can you help us do the work, usually try to talk them out of hiring us in any way we can. <laughs> and say, can you do it on your own? Um, because we, Robert Johnson, you know, believed in us when we did this and we still do it. If we can help you do this on your own and build your own capacity to think this way and do use these data, that's what we prefer. So we are here to help you if you want to do that. Okay, so from here, we have a break, but you can head over to the building. It's just across the street to our main room. Um, is there any announcements? Um, I'll be outside the door just to collect your evaluations if you oh, have yeah. filled out, and then lunch is done. Lunch will start at 11.30. Most of you are probably registered. We'll kind of start things over there at noon, so um, yeah, just head over there. You will eat well during these three days, so, uh, so yeah, and if, if anyone wants a technical manual, we printed them for you. Whoops. If you don't want to log at home, I understand. Um, there's some other things. There's just... Oh, maybe that's what they meant to give me. Is it not in your thing? Oh, it's on the back. I see it on the back. Oh, so the evalu evaluation is oh. on the back. <laughs> Can I have two sets of packets? Yeah. So that's the, these are the survey questions, and these are the technical manuals. This just talks about partner. I don't know if you want it, but <laughs> Okay, yeah. You can put that together like a packet. Thank you. Yeah, that? Okay. yeah if you guys would. Well, we can just use that later. Oh, sorry. Thank you for grabbing one of these. Hi.